hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to this talk. It's called Source Maps Through the Looking Glass. Uh, I realize now that a looking glass is not actually a magnifying glass. It's a mirror. Uh, so, but humor me, the idea of this talk is that we're just going to do like a deep dive into source maps, maybe use them today. Um, and they're, but they're kind of a black box technology, so we're just going to go deeper and kind of uncover what's there. Um, my name is, unfortunately, Ben Vinegar. It's a real name. Uh, I go on Twitter by the handle Bentelgen, if you want to check that out. I work at a company called Sentry. We're um, an open source company. We develop a tool called Sentry that informs you of errors in your production applications, be they single page JavaScript applications or server side code or mobile apps. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in this talk. So to kick things off, I just want to talk a little bit about how JavaScript is used today in 2017. How many people here use you know, like a modern dialect of JavaScript, ES, ES6, 2015, 2017, 2030, 2045? Okay, so most people. Um, then you're familiar with this slide, which is um, a really simple function. It's using ES6 modules. Uh, it's using this like REST operator. And uh, it also has arrow functions. Uh, I love all these little language features. They make writing JavaScript more fun. But I work on a software product that still targets some older browsers, like IE 11. And I want to make sure that that code works in those browsers. So I run it through a tool called Babel. And it generates code that looks like this. Um, and this, is, this will run in IE 11 just fine. Uh, and I want to keep going, because for some contrived reason, I, I must also wrap this in Webpack. And so I run that through this tool, and it generates a lot more content. But of course, I don't actually want to ship all of these characters to end users. So I run this through Uglify one more time, and I'm left with something like this. Um, this probably seems pretty familiar for most people. So somebody, somebody famous once said, like, JavaScript has become the assembly language of the web. And I'd heard this many times over the years. And I always thought this was something that Brendan Eich said, you know, creator of JavaScript. Maybe it was when he announced ASM.js or he announced WebAssembly. Seems like the kind of thing that he would talk about. But it's actually, it was coined all the way back in 2011 um, by a guy, Scott Hanselman. He's a blogger and an author. And he was just sort of observing that when he browsed around sort of his favorite websites, be they Google or Facebook, that the code that was being served to him, like, nobody wrote this. This was, this was being generated by tools. Um, and this was before Babel, this was before Webpack, et cetera. And the comparison to assembly is pretty apt. Um, it's not just the idea that it's sort of like a compilation target, but assembly is really hard to read. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with sort of compiled languages or even written assembly, but it looks like this. This is like you know the actual machine instructions that your computer uses to do stuff. Um, some of these commands are stuff like, you know, move a value from one memory location to a register, do a, do a addition operation on that register, jump to another location in your program, et cetera. Um, I have experimented with trying to debug uh, compiled applications using, you know, just assembly, and I have found this very difficult. Uh, I have no idea what my program is doing whatsoever. Um, and maybe if you're a programming god, you might be able to do this, but uh, I'm incapable. And of course, you know, if you're debugging in the browser, it, it, it doesn't look too dissimilar. Um, my code looks like this. I have single letter variables. All my functions have been reduced to nonsense. Um, stepping around, you know, like you can kind of maybe understand what your program is doing, but it's really difficult. Similarly, this isn't just debugging in Chrome. Uh, this is a screenshot from Sentry. It's an open source tool again. And what we do is we take sort of like crash reports from client-side JavaScript, and we suck those up into our, into our web server, and we give you sort of a stack trace to help you reproduce the bug. Um, but it's not a very good experience when you're dealing with minified code. You know, for me to tell you, hey, this is a bug, and it's occurred on line 27, column 31,652, uh, that's kind of difficult to understand what's happening. So compiled languages have always had, at least for the longest time, they've had this concept of debug symbols. What that means is if I compile an application, and I add this like dash dash debug symbol on Mac OS. I get this, you know, besides sort of like the program that I've output, I also get this dsim folder on, on Mac OS if I'm building with LDB and I, or sorry, LLVM, and I don't want to get too deep into that. But if I fire up my debugger again with my compiled program and that like those symbol files are, are available, 
Um, the experience of debugging is a lot easier. Now I can actually step through the code uh, that I wrote. I can actually inspect variables using their logical names and not using like memory addresses or, or register locations. Um, and it's, it's plausible to debug things this way. So debug symbols, you know, they map machine instructions to source locations and symbols, et cetera. So why don't we have this, like why, if we've had this forever in sort of like compiled languages, why, why don't we have them in JavaScript or in other languages? Um, well, JavaScript is different because we're not, you know, we're not compiling into some intermediate form, be it bytecode or machine code. We're really just taking text and we're transforming it to some other piece of text, right? So the existing sort of debug symbol formats or, or whatever didn't really work in this world. And furthermore, you know, when you have debug, debug symbols, like when you're, when you're compiling with debug symbols, like that's, that's a folder that you have you know, on your local machine and you're debugging with it. You're not, you're not sending it over the internet back and forth. And so many of these like formats that support debug symbols aren't really designed for consumption over the web. So this is a, a, a bit of a pr long preamble to where we all know where this is going, which is source maps and, and what it, the topic of this talk is. So if you didn't know, source maps are pretty much just a JSON file. And it's got a format whose contents let you map um, file names, lines, columns that appear in sort of an output file uh, back into up to n input source files. The source files can be any kind of text. Like, there's nothing about the source map format specifically that's, you know, um, designed strictly for JavaScript. It can be used for things like CSS to SAS or CSS to less or other transformations. And it's also optimized for plain text transfer over a network, over HTTP. And we'll see what that means a little bit. So a little bit of history. Um, the very first version of the source map spec, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was dated around 2009, and it was built for a tool called Clojure Inspector. Um, does anyone here use Clojure Compiler? Okay. Um, maybe five hands. I'm actually surprised. I thought there'd be more than that. Uh, but Clojure Compiler is sort of like, it's, a, it's an optimizer and a minifier, kind of like Uglify, kind of like Prepack, if you've, if you've looked at that a little bit. Um, but it's been around for a long time. And one of the Clojure Compiler de developers wanted to map what they were seeing in their, in their sort of minified, you know, compiled output back to the original code. And so he built a, a, a Firebug, Firebug plugin, and this Firebug plugin used effectively the very first version of source maps. Uh, it went through a couple of revisions, um, and the latest version is actually revision three, which was written in 2011. It's a long, you know, six years ago is a long time um, in our world. It's been updated a few times, but something to know is that this is just a proposal. There's no, like, you can't go to MDN or what WG and find some, you know, really, like, fleshed out specification that says what a source map is. It's just a Google Doc that's on the internet, and, you know, at any given moment, you can see who's reading this Google Doc at the same time. It's usually about a dozen people, and you can attempt to chat with them, but they're usually not listening. So despite the fact that this is sort of like this kind of janky specification, it doesn't have like a standards body behind it, it doesn't really matter because everything kind of uses it, which is really cool. Um, compilers, you know, be, they, be it Babel or TypeScript or even Mscripten, which is like a JavaScript to, or sorry, a C to JavaScript compiler. Optimizers like Uglify, Clojure, and yes, Prepack, module bundlers, every browser, uh, tools like Sentry. Um, so we, you know, we unminify stack traces. Uh, node source map support is an interesting uh, node module that will sort of automatically convert, you know, stack traces that come from exceptions into their original format if you're using, um, you know, maybe you're using TypeScript on the server or something like that. So we're going to go through like an end-to-end -end example to just kind of understand how source maps work. I'm going to bring us all the way back to this function that I showed you at the beginning, add.js, it's just an add function with um, arrow functions and you know, rest operators, et cetera. I'm gonna run this through Babel. We're not gonna go through the whole like Webpack Uglify thing just to keep this simple. So from Babel, I can just say like, hey, take add.js, output this file, add.dist.js. Um, I'm using this ES2015 preset to you know, target a particular set of browsers, and then um, also specify this source maps uh, configuration. And if I run that command, a couple things are going to happen. Uh, my disk file is going to be modified a little bit if I didn't run 
um, from when I would have otherwise written that, this sort of Babel command. And also I get a source map file. But before I jump to that source map file, like, let's take a look at the output file add.dist.js. It's pretty much exactly the same as I would have run it without that source map flag, except one key addition, which is it adds this line to the end of the file, which is this source mapping URL directive. This is the thing that tells browsers and other tools where to find the source map file that is sort of associated with this JavaScript file. So browser downloads your JavaScript file, goes to the very end, goes to the last line, looks for this comment, and goes, aha, I need to download add.dist.js.map. And that path is relative to wherever you're hosting this disk file. Uh, it doesn't have to be relative. You can specify sort of like a full path, and that's where you know, the browser will download it from. A lot of people talk to me about like they want to use source maps, but they don't want to expose them publicly. Well, there's a couple tricks you can do with that. Like, for example, you can have your source mapping URL point to um, a location that's maybe only accessible on a virtual private network, so only you can download it, and other sort of interlopers can't. You could even host those files, like your source map file, locally on your own, you know, on your own little web server. So um, you can point back at localhost, and, and you'll be able to download that file. Another thing that not everybody is aware of is you don't have to use this source mapping URL directive. There's actually a header called source map that you can just sort of send down um, with your JavaScript file that is a, is a clue to the browser and other tools where you can find the associated source maps. That's something else you can do. Um, but not everybody has the power to just sort of arbitrarily change headers. Um, again, I mentioned CSS earlier. Like, it doesn't strictly have to be this like slash slash uh, comment from that JavaScript understands. You can also use this you know CSS comment at the end of your file too. So, if you want to get started with source maps and you just want to use them, this is pretty much all you need to know. You you, gen you use tools. You generate a source map file. Um, you put them on your web server. The browser will download them. And then now when you start debugging, you get to step through your original code, which is pretty cool. Like, that's it. Um, so I recommend doing that. Um, similarly, Sentry, like, we, we kind of act like a browser. We actually, like, when we see stack traces that have um, JavaScript files in them, we'll actually try to like, actually fetch those JavaScript files. And if, there's, if we see that there's a source map header or there's a source mapping URL directive, we'll download that source map and we'll apply it to your stack trace and try to like, you know, uh, show you the original file, the line, and the column. And we even pull surrounding source code too, which is kind of cool. So in this case, this is actually like an example um, from our live application with some JSX, uh, and that's kind of neat. Uh, but we're going to go a little bit deeper because I think it's interesting to just understand how does a source map even work. How many people here have like tried to open a production source map in like their text editor? Okay, uh, was that a good experience? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, typically, this is what happens to me, which is like my editor pretty much crashes, um, and that's because source maps can get really big. Uh, it's totally normal for them to be megabytes in size. We've seen source maps as large as 30 megabytes, which is pretty absurd. The reason that we started this with like a pretty contrived, simple example is that this entire source map can actually fit in one slide. Um, so this is what a source map looks like. I've sort of uh, you know, pushed around the white space a little bit so that you can read it a little easier. We'll go through all the pieces of this really quickly. So the very first thing is just the version string. And this is just a, this is just a clue to the browser, like what version of the source map spec am I dealing with? As we learned earlier, version 3 is the latest thing from 2011. So pretty much everything says version 3. The file is, you know, what file is associated with this? Like what is this source map for? And in our case, it's add.dist.js. Um, a source map is associated with one file, one output file. Sources are a list of input files that went into this output file. In our case, there's only a single source file that's add.js. But if this were a production application with many components, many modules, whatever, you can imagine this could be dozens, hundreds, maybe even a thousand files. Sources content, this is sort of like an optional feature of source maps. Babel actually just inlines all of our input source code into the source map uh, for convenience. And you don't have to do this, but and this is also what contributes to source maps being so large, but it's pretty convenient because it just sort of works out of the box. You don't have to deal with um, other problems like where do you find all of these other source files. Lastly, this is, this is, you know, this is the biggest part of, of what makes a source map a source map, which is this big mappings blob. So to bring that up here, it looks like this. It kind of looks like a bunch of nonsense. Um, 
but it isn't, and we're gonna walk through actually translating something by hand just so you understand what's taking place. So one thing to know is that when you're doing like, like source map parsers, they work through a source map or this mappings property linearly. They start at the very beginning. The very beginning represents line zero. Uh, it's not like random access. You can't just go to the middle of this blob. You actually have to process the whole thing in order. So each semicolon denotes a new line. Um, so we start at line zero. And you'll notice that this source map actually begins with five semicolons. And that might seem kind of weird. The reason for that is that Babel outputs some sort of like preamble to the output file that for which there's actually like no matching code in our input file. And the source map basically recognizes that. It's like, hey, just skip over this because there's, 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 there's nothing for us to even point to here. So if we continue, we go past those sort of like, you know, those first opening lines, we get to what's called a segment. Segments are comma separated, and these are the things that actually, you know, make the translation from your output source to your input source. Segments are made of variable length quantities. Now, what is QA, maybe that's an L or an I, I'm not actually sure, GB. So there's a variable length quantity, it's or called VLQ. Um, this is sort of a, a format that's designed for efficiently encoding arbitrarily large integers. It was actually, it's like an old spec. Uh, the values are sort of base 128 encoded, but it's a little different. And it was designed for MIDI files originally, which is pretty interesting. So it kind of looks like this. Like for, for single integers, like there's one character that matches this. This is fine. But as you get larger, like 123 is only two characters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is five characters. Or sorry, six. Um, the idea here is that because a source map is going over the while, like it's characters, it's plain text, and we've got to download it, um, we want to represent that in as small uh, a format as possible. What's also neat about VLQ is arbitrary, arbitrary length tuples of data can also be encoded efficiently, and that's what that last value there is on the bottom, right? 0, 1, negative 1, 1, 2, 3 is represented by this five, these five characters. So we get to avoid commas, we get to avoid um, like the negative prefix, which is pretty cool. The specifics of how to actually sort of like convert these, I don't really know. Uh, I just let this library called VLQ, which you can install via NPM to just sort of decode them, and that's how I work through a lot of these problems. So let's go back to this, you know, QAI GB. Um, if I decode this, I actually get a tuple, which is 80416. So what does that mean? Um, I mean, once you break it down, it's pretty simple. This is where now the source map sort of starts to make sense. The very first value is the column in our output file, add.dist.js. Um, remember that we're, because we're working linearly, we sort of already know what the line number is, uh, which is like line five. Um, the second value is the index into the sources array. We only have a single source, that's add.js, so this, this value is zero. Um, and then the final, the final two values are the line in the input source and the column in the input source file. So if I convert this, this is basically what this, this segment is trying to tell us. Um, we are currently on line five, column nine of add.dist.js. For this particular segment, it's add.js. It's line five, it's column 17. And if we kind of break this down and we go back to my input file, my output file, it's really just this. It's saying like, hey, in the output file, add is over here. And in my input file, add is over there. Um, and that's pretty much how this thing works. One thing to note here is you'll notice that this is not a character by character translation, right? Source maps really just, I mean, they could be character by character. There's nothing that would stop you from doing this. But the idea here is that we only need to map the start locations of identifiers. Um, and that's efficient because if we mapped every single character, you know, this mapping, this, this mappings property would be gigantic. But if we only have to do identifiers, it's much smaller. So I'm only going to convert one more value just for, just to kind of like bring this idea home. The very next value, the very next segment, if you can see it, is actually just a capital G, which is a little confusing because it's like, wait a minute, didn't I need four values to actually translate something? Like, what am I going to do with this single value, which is actually an eight? Um, oh, actually, I think it's a three. I may have messed this up. So segment values are relative. And this, uh, this is sort of like a space-saving kind of idea, right? Like, I don't need to have the absolute value Every, for every single segment. I can just work off of what I, what I was doing in the last segment. So we just add this value 
to the previous segment and we get a new location, which is um, 11 instead of character 8. Bear with me, this is a little confusing, but the idea here is, you know, there was another, there was another identifier add. Like add appeared twice in this, in this output file, right? So this is actually just linking back to the same location. Um, remember the very first value of that tuple is um, the location in the output file, right? So uh, line, you know, uh, line five, line 17, like that didn't change. So what's really happening here is that the source map is telling us that um, this add function just appears twice in the output file, which is kind of interesting. So hopefully you have a, a basic understanding of how this is going. Um, I would just kind of keep working through these values, keep translating them, keep getting um, new translations. Um, but the idea here is that I, I finish in a place where I basically take all these values and I dump them into some data structure like a table so that you know, going forward, I don't actually look at the source map. I just kind of like query this table for the data. Um, this is how Web Inspector works. This is how other tools, Sentry, et cetera, work. They just, they just munge through a source map, generate you know, this big sort of lookup table, and then the rest is just kind of works by itself. If this seems like a lot to take in, uh, the good news is that you don't really ever need to know the particulars of how this works. I just wanted to sort of explain you know, what's happening because it's kind of neat. There is a tool called source-map. Um, it's on NPM. It's from Mozilla. And it does kind of what we just did. It actually just kind of breaks down the source map for you and provides an API where you can query the source map to look up locations for yourself. Um, the API is a little complex because it does a lot, but it looks like this. I import this library. I read my source map file from the file system. I then create what's called a source map consumer. And then I can look up you know, original position for line six, column zero, whatever, whatever I want to look up, and it will tell me which file, what line, what column. So uh, if you are working with source maps and you've ever struggled with sort of like, it seems like the lines and columns don't match up exactly the way that you wanted, I recommend using this library to just look up the values yourself to see if they make sense. I can spare like a lot of time with debugging. So this kind of takes me to the end. Um, what do we learn? This is a bit of a wrap up. So source maps are sort of, kind of, debug symbols for the web. That's close enough. They're just files, lines, and columns. They're designed for efficient transmission over, over HTTP. Like that's why, that's why VLQ values, that's why they're sort of like these relative segments, et cetera. Um, and the cool thing is that almost everything supports them today. So if you're not using them, you should be using them. Um, so again, my name's Ben Vinegar. Uh, I hope that you found this talk vaguely illuminating. Um, if you want to find me, this is me on the internet. This is a link to pretty much everything that we talked to today. Please check out Sentry. It's really helpful and it's open source. You can just kind of run it on your own server. Uh, thank you.